get by It resides between my eyes Walk through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a beach If you find the same like right now I feel like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. You know, Todd, I always like to mention past guests um, and some episodes people should check out. Actually, this one hasn't come out yet, but maybe by the time this comes out, it will. But um, I had the co-founder of Pixar on. Um, I've been working on and communicating with Alvy Ray Smith. He told stories about Steve Jobs and George Lucas. It was a crazy, amazing episode talking about like real living history and the founding of Pixar. And I you know, suggest people wow. check it out. And um, I've been communicating with him, I think for nine years, Todd. So, you know, all, sometimes people that you reach out to will come on and sometimes it takes nine years yeah. to communicate with someone before they come on. And um, so check out that many, many others. I was talking to another one today, which I guess relates to Todd. You know, I'm going to formally introduce Todd Tasky in a sec, you know, in a second with Potomac Business Capital. He has the Second Bite Podcast, which is amazing. If you're an agency owner, you should check it out. If you are anyone thinking of selling your company mm. or buying companies, you should check it out. Um, but um, Chris Voss, I interviewed Chris Voss from, ne- if, if anyone's heard the book of Never Split the Difference, one of my favorite ones, he was an ex-FBI hostage negotiator. I listened to it, Todd, because I wanted to learn how to negotiate with my kids because they're like terrorists. Sometimes they refuse to do things. So I listen to it from a parenting perspective, but it's got a lot of business applications. Um, so check that out. The interview I did with Chris Voss as well. And this episode is brought to you by Rise 25. And if you listen to any episodes, we help businesses give to and connect to their dream 100 relationships. And we do that by helping you run your podcast. And, and Todd, as you know this, the number one thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking at ways to give to my relationships. How can I profile them, put them on a pedestal? So there is no better way I've found that to have your own podcast and be able to feature and talk to the companies and people you admire and that you want to shout from the rooftops of what they're doing, like Todd's company. Like I think if you have an agency, just like if you have a business, you should have a podcast, you have an agency, you should, and you're at a certain level, you should talk to Todd Tassi because eventually helps you sell your agency, but not sell it so you can retire on a beach necessarily, but sell it so that you can continue doing what you love doing. So um, I'm going to introduce you, Todd, but I know we're, we're friends now because of podcasting. And Todd is a 20 plus year entrepreneur, business owner, investment banker, business advisor, and he gives amazing M&A advice. And he basically helps agencies sell their business. And you can check it out, uh, potomacbusinesscapital.com. Check out his podcast, secondbitepodcast.com. And um, basically, you know, go listen to what a second bite is. If you don't know, if you do, you know, second bite can be bigger than the first bite. So Todd, thanks for joining me. Jeremy, happy to be here. It's always good to be with you. So um, I kind of wanted to do, you know, Mike, the question in my head is, what's the most valuable thing an agency should know when selling their company. And I kind of want to flip that also at some point and say, what's the most valuable thing someone buying an agency should know when buying a company? Maybe it's the same, maybe it's different. So since you're an expert and you, this is what you live and you breathe every single day, um, I just want to start there with most valuable things for an agency when they're selling, you know, thinking about selling their agency or maybe even before they're thinking of selling their agency. Yeah. I think, you know, from the beginning, you know, the question is always, how do you, how do you add maximum value to your customers? And if you're adding maximum value to your customers and you're running a good business and you've got a valuable business, then, you know, that's where everything starts from. So I'm, I'm assuming you have that. And as you and I've talked before, most of the clients that we serve, have EBITDA between a million and $5 million. And when you're in that category, the question is, starts to become, what is the best path forward for my business? And, and when guys tend to look at that, they come to a conclusion that to grow the business, many times to get to that next level, 
It's about hiring more salespeople, investing more in your marketing, and having additional service or product lines. And then the question becomes, do you want to do that and make those investments on your own? Or if there's an opportunity to plug into an organization that has all the things that you want already, and instead of spending your money, you can actually take some chips off the table and de-risk a little bit, that becomes a pretty compelling story, especially if, when you can do that with people that you like and respect. And that's what we help people do. Um, timing to that is, is important. It, you know, it's interesting because, you know, we did a transaction earlier this year and my client's about a million dollars of EBITDA. And he would love to run and grow a big business and have private equity support him in doing that. And for a whole bunch of reasons we can cover later or another time, private equity won't really make an investment unless you're above 2 million of EBITDA. And he's almost at a million and it's taken him five years to get there. So he's a few years away. The transaction that we did for him, he got a very nice multiple for his business, took half in cash and half in stock. The company he took stock in is, was acquired by private equity less than a year ago. He is the first acquisition from that company. He's about as ground floor as you could be in a private equity backed enterprise. So he's thrilled with that. We essentially accomplished something for him that he wasn't gonna be able to accomplish for quite a while, number one, and he got cash, number two, and he's, he is with a group of entrepreneurs and financial guys that are well above his pay grade that will lift and rise him, and he will make an important contribution in the success of that business. A fantastic fit all around. So that was, that was terrific. I want to go into an example of second bite. Right. We talk about the second bite podcast, um, an example when it comes to that. And, and I think there's a caveat with the second bite when we're talking about what type of acquires actually will result in a second bite. Because I think maybe in some circles it's like, well, just consider what you got, all you're going to get, and don't worry about the next stage. And that's maybe for a smaller company acquiring another smaller company. But when it comes to private equity, it's a different story. I mean, they are going to be buying and they're looking to sell at some point, right? So I love to talk about maybe some misconceptions of the second bite. Yeah. So a couple of things. Second bite, in my mind, falls into two categories. Number one, your second bite could be a cash distribution over the next few years, also known as an earnout. That's a, the, a less exciting second bite. Um, but one that exists particularly or oftentimes if you're going, if you're being acquired by what's known as a strategic buyer. In today's world, many strategic buyers are backed by private equity, just like the example I just gave you. Private equity will typically be into a company for what they will describe as three to seven years. And they're looking for a return on that money that they have invested that's somewhere between, let's say, four times and, and seven or eight times on, on your money. So it, it, the hope is that the investment that we'll make by rolling forward is the lingo, some of the equity, then you know, hopefully that's a much bigger upside. And there's, there's many, many examples where that turns out to be exactly the case. So to give you one piece, I've got a client currently, they're out in the mountain states. We did a real good transaction for them. Uh, they got high single digit millions. They've been running their business for 10 years. They were about $2 million of EBITDA. We sold them to a private equity group. Um, they got high single digit millions and they got roughly 40% of the company. That was just two years ago. That was November of 2019. During the, during the summer of COVID, they did two additional transactions that added about five and a half million of EBITDA. And 
as we sit here in the summer of 2021, they anticipate that this year they'll do $11 million of EBITDA. I know they're considering two other acquisitions that would add four or five million more EBITDA to that. But if, if it just keep it as it is at, at 11 million of EBITDA this year, a business like that in this market will probably trade for you know, 12 or 13 times EBITDA, maybe even a little bit more. Market's pretty strong right now. So that's 140-ish million dollars of, of value. The company has about 25 million of debt on it uh, from the acquisitions. And my client's been diluted down from about 40% to about 27 or 28%. But let's say roughly they have a quarter ownership in a net $100 million enterprise. And the first bite that they got was call it eight, nine ish million dollars. There's, and that was for 60%. The 40% in two years is worth around 25 or so million dollars. It's a yeah. tremendous outcome. These guys have no intention of selling that business now. They have full intention in growing it. So that their second bite, hopefully, will be six or seven or eight times what their first bite was. And, and that's how you draw it up on paper all the time. Right. And, and, you know, if you find the right fit and the right people and the right culture and you match all those things up, you know, those things happen. Now, last quick point on that is I'll give you, we're talking to them now with a client that uh, is a Facebook agency. So let's say they're two years later to the game. The company's already bigger. They, they're, multiple on if they decide to do the transaction and join them, their second bite will not be as big. So it won't be four times. Because that company was earlier on in the acquisition. But it, but it will happen in two years instead of happening in five years, right? So, so all of those are, are part of that sliding scale of when does a transaction happen? Who are the people we're partnered with? You know, on and on from that standpoint. But it puts it puts a seller in a, in a position that if, if they sell to a group that's going to exit in another year, they would probably be almost entirely out of their, you know, earn out or their second bite within a year or two years. That could be pretty attractive. Does a buyer Todd typically share those things? Like we're looking to buy you and then in two years here, our timeline is two years or four years, or is that more after the fact that they're sharing those things? Yeah. That, I mean, it's a, it's a question we always ask um, and good buyers. I've got a, a group right now that we're negotiating an LOI with. They want, their goal is to sell by 2024. Um, that's, you know, three years from now, a lot of stuff can happen in three years. You know, as, as everybody listening to this knows, there's a lot of stuff I planned for three years ago for now. And some of them came true, some of them didn't. So you never know from that perspective. We've had clients that, you know, somebody have, has knocked on the door sooner than that with a really good offer. And they said, that makes a lot of sense. And so you just recalibrate everything. Talk about multiples for a second. So you mentioned um, at what, and, and again, they, they range, and I know there's an expectation. Some people come up, come to you probably maybe with big expectations, unrealistic expectations, some people not. What are you seeing the ranges that people, if you're at this level, here's what we're seeing at this level. Like, as you mentioned, they rolled a bunch of companies. The multiple is probably much bigger than if they're, they're lower. What are you seeing with multiples and what people can sell for. Yeah, you know, so um, <clears throat> expectations are usually a little bit outsized. And people always point to the high watermark, if you will. Of course. Uh, yeah. Tenuity is a transaction that New Mountain Capital announced back in January that currently sits as kind of the high watermark. Tenuity is a great company, super profitable growing 30% a year, great management team, great contracts, great retention, great technology, great data, 
blah, 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 right? Literally on and on and on, all of it great. And, and so now I am a $2 million business, don't have technology, don't have retention, don't have a, a whole, you know, don't have all these things, but I want that big multiple too, you know? And, and so, so I've got a couple of groups now that expectations are, are way beyond what we feel like we can deliver. And I just don't think it's appropriate for the market will deliver it. But the question is, what will the market deliver? And that's what a process will uncover, right? So if, and, and I could be wrong, maybe the market will say 10 times EBITDA for a $2 million EBITDA business, right? Maybe it is worth 20 million bucks. What I can tell you is the best way to find out for sure is we need to go ask. We need to make sure we have your financials done properly. We need to have a deck that really tells the story simply but accurately about what the company really does and touch on all those points that a buyer is going to want to know right away. And if we get three or four offers for the business that value it on a $2 million business around 15 or $16 million, and then it's pretty clear to me and to the client that that's what the company's worth. So like a seven times in that situation. In, in that situation, it would yeah. be right in that range. And then, you know, give you one other example. We had a letter of intent for a client that we did not close for a bunch of different reasons back in February. And that business traded at, let's call it six times EBITDA. And they got 70% in cash and 30% in stock. The stock in the larger company, that larger company is at $20 million of EBITDA already, $20 million. They valued that company at nine times EBITDA, really low. I think by I would say that company is probably worth 12 or 13 or 14 times EBITDA. So when I do the math on that, the math on that, my client got offered six or six and a half times EBITDA. But 30% of it was 50% discounted to where it should be in the market. So what does all that math come up to? Who knows? So there's always these variances. And the challenge is when you talk to that guy, one of the guys I described at the country club or at dinner in a you know, family event, whatever it is, you sold your business. Yeah. What'd you sell it for? They're going to tell you the top line number only sold it for 15 million bucks. And in the history of golf or dinner meetings or family events, nobody has ever said, how much was in an earnout? How much is in escrow? <laughs> how long is your employment agreement? Right? They're just like, oh wow, fifteen million bucks. Well, what if that guy sold it for ten million dollars and a million a year for ten years earnout? Assuming you're going to grow at twenty percent a year, right? So that that's a little bit exaggerated, but in transactions that we work on, smaller end transactions, it is the terms are equally as important as the value is. Talk about that for a second, terms wise, because you meant, and, and this kind of goes into how should a um, agency think about selling? What should they look for when they're they're ready to sell? And you mentioned a couple things in there, like employment contract. What are some of those finer details that the agency should start to pay attention to when they're ready to sell? So this is this that stuff. There's a hundred details, right? Um, you know, one that comes up all the time, if you have a second bite, so let's just use an example. You sold it for 10 million bucks. You got 7 million in cash. You have 3 million in stock. You think that 3 million is going to be worth 10 million in three or four more years. You like the people, you like everything else. There's a, there is a clause in there most likely, that says, if you leave the company, here's what happens to your stock. And, and then that kind of falls into almost like a grid of four things. Number one, if you quit without cause, for no reason, you just say, I don't want to do this anymore. Right. By the way, the reason we're buying the company is because you, we want you here. We need a partner. You got to drive this part of the business, blah, blah, blah. And you just say, yeah, I don't want to do this anymore. There'll be terms around that. The company can buy back your shares. 
company has to buy back your shares, company buys them back at fair market value, company buys them back at whatever they paid with a 20% discount or a 50% discount or all of that's negotiated, okay? That's if you leave. If you leave for good reason, that's different. Good reason would be something like, you know, you're in Boston, they require you move to the Albuquerque office. I'm not doing that. Well, everybody's moving to the Albuquerque office while well, I quit that. That would be you terminating with good cause. There's different terminology about that that's now more favorable to us because it's their fault. If they terminate us without cause, they just say, geez, you know what? Turns out Fred over here can do what you do, so we're letting you go. That's typically our, because when, when we say to them, hey, we don't want you guys to do that, they're like, oh my gosh, we would never do something like that. Great, then if we do, I either get to put all my shares on you or I get to keep them all. So totally up to me, right? And then the last one is termination for cause, right? So you keep showing up for the podcast drunk and you slur your words. Typically, in our, in, our, <laughs> terrible. in our agreements, you have the right to cure. So they can't say, Jeremy, listen, you've shown up for the last two weeks drunk and slurring your words on the podcast. You're fired. They have to say, Jeremy, listen, you've shown up for the last two weeks drunk and slurring your words on the podcast. You can't do that anymore. And then you've got a period of time to cure that, typically 30 days or so, right? And then you can get into potential bad acts, like if you're convicted for committing a crime, if you, you know, if you kill somebody, if you're, you know, and then you get into, well, wait a second, you can't just be convicted, right? You got, you can't just be charged. There's so many different uh, iterations sometimes you, of this. Sometimes yeah. you can get into way down a rabbit hole, right? Which obviously we try to avoid because it's expensive with legal and nobody wants to go down that. But there, there's a little bit of a, of a construct in there that, and, and then there's a bunch of things you can get into working capital. Let's talk about your non-compete agreement, right? How long is that going to last for? What area is that? Re is it, is your non-compete agreement? For example, you just do email marketing. The firm that bought you does social, does search, does paid, does content. Does your non-compete prohibit you from doing any and all of those things, hmm. right? A lot of different issues and you you the earlier you get out ahead of those things the better off it is the longer it goes into the end when we're just about ready to close the pressure just always builds on the seller because they get a big pot of money if they if they close the deal yeah there's a lot of moving pieces in this and yeah. Um, a lot of iterations of those moving pieces, but I appreciate you sharing some of them because I could see those are some common ones. And, but you know the um, you know the buyer and seller have a lot to work out, and and both want to protect themselves. You know, ultimately, um, talk about why do deals fall through? And I don't know at what stage if you want to talk about me. It, you've probably seen every last thing over the years, over the past couple of decades. And I don't know if it's necessarily in the beginning, but maybe in the middle to end. Why do, what have you seen of why deals fall through? You know why? I, what I see most often is because nobody's committed to getting a deal done at the beginning. And what I mean by that is when you sign a letter of intent with the buyer, the buyer should be holding a party that night that we finally got these guys to sign an LOI. It was competitive. There was three other groups in there. We went back and forth a few times. We negotiated hard, but we came out with this asset that's going to tuck into our group really well. Or if you're private equity, this is going to be a great portfolio company. We love the management team. We love everything else, right? So, because I know, I know we're going to hit bumps in the process. Negotiating legal, due diligence, financial. I didn't realize your guys were doing it this way. Your contracts say this. I thought they would say that. Whatever it might be, right? Right. I want that buyer to say, you know what? I'm not freaking going back. I mean, we've battled so hard to get here. I'm not giving it up because their contracts, because we thought their contracts were three years and they're only two and a half years or whatever it might be. 
number one. Number two, I want them to know, hey, if, if you're going to require a non-compete like this, which is so not market, remember those three other groups that we went to that we, that we were competing with? I'm sure those guys are going to be reasonable. So you decide how you want to handle it, right? And, and so that's probably the biggest reason why. Um, because there's just not a, there's, I would say, at least a perception of a very competitive process up front to, to, to win a letter of intent. Oftentimes, a, a seller will be like, oh, my God, let's get this signed, let's get this signed. And, and the more you can get into your letter of intent, the less there is to negotiate after that. And by the way, after that, you're committed to that buyer. You cannot continue to shop. You cannot continue to negotiate with others. You have to act in good faith. So your time to get a lot of your stuff done is before you sign a letter of intent. Yeah. I find Todd, there's a lot of parallels to marriage in this situation, <laughs> you know, um, because, you know, in marriage, there's bumps, you know, when you have kids, it causes stress, there's a bunch of stresses that this process caused. So if people aren't committed. There's just, there's reasons along the way to, Abandon, I guess. So, but let's yeah. let's assume both people have the best of intent in the beginning. What are you see big bumps? Maybe it doesn't kill the deal, but it's a big point of contention during the deal. Like you mentioned, one thing about contracts uh, sizes. Like if you're an, if someone's an agency now listening, are we better button these up based on yeah. your advice right now if we're going to sell? Yeah, you know, having recurring revenue. So. Uh, you know, I will say oftentimes, so recurring revenue is a big one. That's helpful. By the way, if you have month to month contracts versus one year contracts, makes no difference because it's retention that matters. You, you, so you're a, you're a smaller agency and you've got a big global company with a one year contract and they're in month four and they change their mind. What, are you going to sue them? They've got 18 lawyers on the 35th floor. Go ahead, right? It'll never happen. So rather than having, quote unquote, great contracts, I'd like to see great persistency or retention with your customers, right? Mm. But let me, let me just touch on a couple of practical things. Because when you're selling in your, let's say you're one or two guys, right? It's you and me. So we have an agency. People, to make this up, start on day one and they work to the 15th, right? And we pay on the 15th and the 30th. Let's just take in this example, we pay them one cycle back. So they started day one. On day 15th, they don't get a paycheck. On day 30, they get a paycheck. That paycheck is for first through the 15th, which is great for our cash flow. Right? Because we had this person working for us for two weeks, didn't even have to pay. So that's great. But now we get the deal close. So the deal closes on the 30th. And the buyer says, You're accruing for your payroll properly, right? But there's a payroll that is going to be. So we close on, on the first of the month. There's a payroll due on the 15th. You know what that payroll's for? That payroll is for the period before that I didn't get any of the benefit from. You kept all the profits to that. So you have to make that payroll. That's your payroll, not my payroll. And then the buyer's like, well, wait a second. That payroll's like $180,000. I know. I don't want to pay it. I didn't get anything for it. And then, and then the, the, the uh, seller oftentimes is like, what the hell? There's, that's ridiculous. Right? That's number one. Number two, we charge people up front. They pay us the beginning of the month for the services we're going to give them through that month. Again, great for our cash flow. We closed on the first of the month, right? We're getting checks on the first of the month for work being done that month. All those checks that came in on the first of the month are not yours. So, it, you know, heaven forbid, you know, that first, you know, why, you know, we want to close on the second or the third or what have you. Now, 
all of that, you know, the ACH inflows or anything else, all of those that I got up front, I don't get, that's not even my money either. Here's the worst thing. So then we got, by the way, I don't know, the week before we closed, we got a $50,000 check to do this guy's website. Going to take us to make it up two months to do it. We got 50 grand. The work for the 50 grand is going to happen over the next two months when I don't own the company. But I say to myself, wait a second, it's in my account. That's my money. It's that if you operate your life, as a lot of guys do, on a cash basis, correct. On an accrual basis, that gets assigned to the work when the work's done. And so guys say, well, wait, so first of all, I lost that 50 grand, so, lost it. Second of all, I don't get, I have to make that payroll for 180 grand. You're taking out of my working capital, the cash in my account, right? Third of all, the, the, the checks that we got in on the first, you're saying, I don't get to keep those either. Screw it. I'm not doing it. This freaking, these guys are screwing me. <laughs> it's what? I'm like, geez, hold on a second, right? That's it. It's, I mean, is it a, a, pl a place where, you know, isn't it just a fraction when you talk about what the sale of the company is going to be? Or is, is it more of a principal thing for people at this point? Like they're just not seeing the big picture or why? You well, know, because so it seems. Let's just take those numbers. Yeah. It's 180 plus 50 plus this. That's for both of my kids, all four years of college. Right. It's just, it, and, and so, so there's part of that. It is short sighted. And, and I think the point you're getting at is, that in and of itself is never the reason, but that's a, 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 an accumulation. It triggers, added, it triggers added, someone. Yeah. They're added, maybe having some kind of doubts and that's just kind of right. the thing that pushes them over the edge. Yes. And it adds to other things and other things. So, so it, it, it's stuff like that. The, the buyer typically knows what they're getting. The buyer has done this a bunch of times. The buyer has a team that does this. The seller, my guy, has to run his company at the same time he's got to do this full time. This is, this is double duty for, it wears you down. Yeah. First of all, Todd, I want to thank you. I have one last question. Before, we, before I ask it, I want to point people towards the secondbitepodcast.com. Check out yep. more episodes of your podcast and people can check out potomacbusinesscapital.com um, and learn more about everything. And if you are an agency owner um, and over, I guess, what would you say is, is a good number to start to engage with you in a conversation? You know, typically I would say it's around a million dollars of, mm -hmm. it, it's interesting because there's, there's time, this is why we will, oftentimes will talk to anyone you know that finds us through the podcast or through you or other friends but i've got a group right now we did a transaction with earlier they do digital marketing they're an agency focused on the smb small business market and they're looking to add another acquisition later in 2021 somewhere around 750 800,000 of ebitda somewhere in that range to up to a million or so which is lower than we typically do, but it would be, an, but this is a great organization. It'd be a great additional contribution. So A, if you are a digital marketing firm focused on that part of the market, the SMB market, we would be happy to talk to you, even if you're below a million dollars. Otherwise, if typically somewhere between a million and 5 million, seems like a lot of the transactions we do are somewhere in that two-ish or so million dollars, but we're always happy to, to begin relationships, whether that means we jump into something immediately or we can just be a resource and, and you know, hopefully have a future opportunity. Yeah. So last question, Todd, quickly is, I'd love to hear some of your favorite resources in general. Like we mentioned, obviously, secondbytepodcast.com. Um, you know, both of us, I think, are a fan of, John Warlow's Built to Sell. Yeah. Um, also, you know, I know a lot of the the people you talk to and help run and do EOS. Um, yeah, so I'm yeah. wondering some resources that you recommend or you like. Yeah, EOS is a great one. 
uh, the entrepreneurial operating system. They have a bunch of material, a bunch of books. You can do it yourself. You can get help for your firm. I, I've got dozens of clients that have used them. I've got cl clients that have told me EOS saved their life, saved their marriage, saved their company. So certainly worth checking out. You mentioned Chris Voss. I've read Never Split the Difference three times. It, it will help you negotiate with your wife and children. <laughs> It'll also, it just helps you. And the great thing about Chris's job or Chris's book is that it talks about how I can get what I want and you get what you want. Recognizing that there's some realities to that, right? Um, you know, I, I know there's one story in his book where he talks about these guys are, hot, are, are standing off the police. They've got a hostage. They're inside some apartment with guns. We don't want to go to jail. I can't help. That's not possible. I want to sell my agency for 15 times EBITDA. I, I can't do that. That's not possible. <laughs> Let's talk, right? So if you, if you don't want to get shot by the police when you can come out of the, uh, that's something I, we can work on together. Right. If you, you know, want to be treated with dignity, if you, you know, if you don't want to be paraded in front of the cameras, these are things I can do. And he talks about making people feel comfortable enough that they can be honest enough to trust you enough to let you deliver on that. And so I learned, I mean, that that I would say this, if you want to learn, if if you read EOS, their book is called Traction. You read Traction, you read Never Split the Difference. Um, Man, that would, you know, we're in the middle of the summer, but that would be a very successful summer and you will be a much better, what more well-educated, more centered CEO. Um, those are two great resources. What, um, what episodes should they check out on your podcast? Oh, geez, all of them, I would think. Here's the, here's the thing people <laughs> love about my podcast, Jeremy, to be, yeah. to be self-serving for a minute. Yeah, I, I love your podcast. We interview guys that are unknown that people have never heard of that have done something really remarkable, which is to build and to sell an agency or a business for seven or eight figures. It is a tremendous accomplishment. And you can hear directly from them what that was like. So you don't have to hear me blabbering on about we can do this and we can do that. Guys will tell you, here's what I was afraid of. Here's what worked out. This surprised me. This I liked, this I didn't, right? And, and that is that's a hard resource to come across. And I think that's why people really like it because they're hearing from, you know, their, their fellow entrepreneurs about what's real and what's not without a lot of hype or BS in there. Yeah. Todd, I want to be the first one to thank you. Everyone check out second bite podcast, Potomac business capital.com. Check out more episodes of inspired insider and rise 25. Thanks everyone. Thanks. Todd. Thank you, Jeremy. Great to be on the show. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See, life's like a beach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand